Welcome to Expound, our verse-by-verse -verse study of God's Word. Our goal is to expand your knowledge of the truth of God by explaining the Word of God in a way that is interactive, enjoyable, and congregational. I remember the first time I was exposed to an idea that has slowly changed our world creeping in our homes and even our heads like a thief in the night. I was sitting in my cultural anthropology class in the Bay Area when the professor asked what so many people throughout the ages has asked, what is truth? And I remember the day as if it was yesterday, because in that class there was an odd mix of people. On one side there was a nun. I had a Muslim fella sitting next to me. I had some hippie guys over here, and of course me being the Tolkien Christian. And we started to dialogue and discuss what the truth is. And the conversation got a little bit heated. And finally, one of these hippie guys said, you know, you're not getting it. And he was referring to me because I was taking the stance that there is truth. So he said, I'm going to tell you a story. And it's going to make it all clear in the end. And I said, oh, I can't wait to hear this story. So he said, imagine a guy who's on a journey, and in the distance, he sees what he thinks is a flag on a pole. And he spends his life trying to seek and discover what it is on the end of this path. And so he starts to walk. And along the way, he meets another fella. And he says, sir, I, I hate to bother you, but I'm trying to discover what it is that's at the end of this path. I think it's a flag. What do you think it is? And the fellow looked up and goes, oh, it's obvious what it is. That, my friend, is a lamp post. He goes, oh, a lamp post. But still not knowing himself, he decides to continue on. So he walks further down the path. And lo and behold, he bumps into a lady. And he calls the lady over and goes, excuse me, miss. I need to ask you a question. What is it down this path? I think it's a flag on a pole. But I just heard that it's a lamppost. Pray tell. Tell me, what is it that I'm seeing? And she goes, oh, it's very obvious what that is. And he goes, amazing, what is it? She goes, well, it's an eagle on the pole. And he said, ah, amazing. But still, not convinced, he decides to continue on until he gets to the end of the path. And he looks up, and he discovers that it's not a flagpole that it's not a light post, that it's not an eagle. Rather, it's a note tied to a pole, and he pulls it off, and it says, Johnny was here. <laughs> and he scratches his head, and he realizes that each person had their own perspective on truth of what it really is, and so every person has their own angle. Therefore, there isn't one truth, but multiple truths. And you guys are looking at me kind of like I was looking at him. I'm going, oh, I don't quite follow you. And then I asked him a question. I said, so you're telling me Truth is undiscoverable because everyone has their own perceptions of what truth is. And he goes, exactly, I knew you would get it. I knew we would be on the same page once I told you my story. And then I asked him a question, but what was it really? 
And he goes, well, it was a, a note posted on a pole. And I go, so the truth is that it was a note posted on a pole. And he goes, no, dude, you're missing the whole point. <laughs> Everyone had their own perspective of what it is. And I said, no, you're missing the point. The truth is what it really is. And then we kept going back and forth, and people were chiming in. And then I said, let me tell you a story. So I grabbed a book, and I said, tell me, I'm about to drop this book. Where's it going to go? And he looked at me like I was a moron. And he said, it's going to hit the ground. And then I asked the nun, miss, where's it going to go? And she, she said, well, it's, it's going to hit the ground. And then, of course, I asked a couple of other people. And I said, so there's, there seems to be some sort of consensus what is going to happen to this book. And everyone goes, yeah, it's going to hit the ground. And, of course, they started to say, well, you know, the law of gravity and all this other stuff. I said, I don't believe that. I think when I let go of this book, it's going to fly sideways and hit someone. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? And the dude's just looking at me, well, you know, you're talking about science and I'm talking about something else. And I go, no, we're talking about truth. And then I did that, and it hit the ground. And I said, truth is real. Truth exists. And of course, he didn't swallow it. I didn't swallow his perspective. But I think with the bang of the book on the floor, I made my point pretty good. And of course, the thing I'm referring to that's creeping into our homes and even into our minds is this idea that there is no truth. And tonight, we're going to walk through a meaty teaching to show you that there is truth and that truth is important. Why, why do we discover or why do we even talk about truth? Well, a few reasons. First of all, Jesus talked a lot about truth. If Jesus was engaged with the concept and idea of truth, shouldn't we as his followers be engaged and interested in the concept of truth? Jesus said what? The truth shall what? Set you free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. and the life. And he goes on to discuss and talk about the truth. But we should also be interested in the truth because so many people in this world are so confused as to the reality if truth exists. And I thought it would be appropriate that at the start of UNM and the start of elementary schools and high schools around the city that we discuss truth because so many teachers, so many professors, so many people are telling our kids, our students, our people that there's no truth. And it's important for Christians to combat that idea and say, yes, there is. So what we're going to do tonight is two overarching things. Number one, I'm going to define truth for you. I'm going to define truth. Historically, in a contemporary setting, and then biblically. I know it sounds long, but I'll go through it pretty quickly. And then after I define truth, I'm going to walk you through 2 John, where truth is described for us. So our lesson for tonight is to define truth and to describe truth. And if you have a pen or a piece of paper, I thoroughly encourage you to take some notes because I really believe this is important information. Why? Because you're going to be facing this every single day of your life. Not only with your next door neighbor, not only with your coworker, but what is fed to you on television, what is fed to you via Oprah, what is fed to you in so many avenues, so many outlets, you're being bombarded each day with truth claims. And we need to know where we stand biblically as Christians. So it's very, very important that I think we grasp this concept. So first of all, when we're defining truth, 
Let's look at that historically. And I'm just going to give you a bird's eye view of how truth has been seen throughout the ages. First of all, the ancient Greeks defined truth as aletheia. That's the Greek word, aletheia. And truth was an accurate perspective on reality. So if reality and your perspective matched, they deemed that as truth. And of course, the sciences later picked up on that concept. If reality and our perspective, or later on our experimentations, match, that is truth. So the Greeks did teach that there was some sort of ultimate truth. And then later on, the Romans taught truth, and their word for truth was veritas. That's a Latin word for truth. Veritas was a factual representation of events. So if you gave a factual representation of how things occur in the real world, you are speaking the truth. So one plus one is, that's a factual representation of how things are in our existence, in the world. So the Romans. The Jews also taught that there was truth. And their word for truth was emeth, E-M-E-T-H. And how they saw it, though, is that truth corresponded to God's work, word, and his faithfulness. So what did the Jews do? They started to look to God as the arbitrator and individual who defines truth. But again, they believed in truth. And then, of course, that idea was passed along to the Christians. And Christians saw truth in the person of Jesus Christ. So truth was wrapped up in the life, death, teachings, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as taught through Scripture. Again, Christians taught there was truth. Interestingly enough, even in our modern era, up until the last 50 to 75 years, the world taught that there was something as truth. Our very own Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines truth as the real state of things, facts, an agreement between fact and reality. And here's the point I want you to walk away with, that all throughout history, people have belie believed in truth. Truth has been an important facet to our understanding as human beings. But lo and behold, something changed. And this change is what I was referring to, this creeping thing that has entered in our homes and even into our heads. And this is the idea that truth is non-existent or that truth is relative. And so our contemporary world views truth as a relative concept. There isn't just one truth. There's a multiple truth options for people. Hence the story my co-classmate told. Well, one guy thought it was a flag. One person thought it was a bird, another a lamppost. But it was just a note on a pole. But everyone has their own perspective or perception of truth. That is what has creeped in. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we need to fight against. This idea of hyper-relativism. And I'm going to give you the three types of relativism occurring in this world. And you will then be able to understand when people come to you at work or at school or your neighbor and they start saying stuff like this, you could now fit it where it belongs in this idea of relativism. The first idea is what we call cultural relativism. Cultural relativism. And cultural relativism is, now listen to this, descriptive. It describes a culture or how people believe, think, and act. Let me give you an extreme example. Let's say I was an anthropologist, and I'm going to a new culture. 
a new, let's say, an island in the middle of nowhere, that they practice cannibalism. And I begin to write notes, of course at a distance, you know, about what they believe and what they say and who they are. And then I come back to the United States and I said, the truth of that culture is that cannibalism is an accepted form of eating. It's okay to eat someone else. Therefore, their truth is cannibalism. That is the culture defining what they believe to be true. That is cultural relativism. The second type of relativism is what we call societal relativism. Societal relativism. And this is going to make a lot more sense to us because this is the world in which we live. Societal relativism isn't descriptive, like cultural relativism. It is prescriptive, meaning it prescribes truth to you and I. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, truth is being prescribed to us. Let me give you two concrete examples. Number one, abortion. That is prescriptive or societal truth. Our society has deemed that abortion is okay, therefore it has prescribed it or legalized it for us. And most people believe that abortion's okay because the law says it's okay. Another example of prescriptive truth is the changing nature or the changing definition of a family. Fifty years ago, family was what? A man and a woman, and they had children if they could, and that, that's what constituted a family. Not anymore. Society has prescribed a new idea of what a family is. It has given you a new truth. That is what societal relativism is. And we live it on a day-to-day -day basis. The third type of relativism, again, is one very common. It is what we call I, like me, like an iPhone, an iPad. You get the point. I relativism. And it's not descriptive necessarily, nor is it prescriptive. Rather, it's inscriptive. It's the individual writing their own script for their own life. My truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. Don't bother me with all that stuff. I don't believe in your truth. My truth is something completely different. Somewhere else. You've heard that, haven't you? Oh, don't talk to me about that Jesus stuff. I don't believe that. That may be your truth. That's not my truth. That is what we call I-relativism. And these important understandings of what truth is really help us understand where people are coming from. Because believe it or not, people are using I-relativism and societal relativism and cultural relativism to change the dialogue to change the conversation that's going on in the world. Let me give you a classic example. Luckily, it's not here in the United States, but it's in Europe. There's a gentleman who's a pedof he's a pedophile. He's, pe he he's pedophilia. He likes children. And he has argued in the courts, I think it's Sweden or Germany, I'd have to go back and look, but he's argued in the courts on his own behalf that his truth is different from society's truth and or culture's truth. Therefore, the larger truth, because truth is relative, you cannot impose your truth upon me. It just so happens my truth is I like little kids. I like to do things with small children. Just because you don't like to doesn't mean you could impose your truth upon me. And you guys are going, no, that's not true. Yes, it's true. It's happening. It's in the world today. And let's even take it in an, a, another example to show you something a little more ridiculous. But let's say my truth was I don't like blonde-haired people. 
And so as I look out over this congregation, I'm looking at all the blonde-haired people, and I say, I'm going to go and punch you in the face because you're blonde. That happens to be my particular truth. And you're going, you know, that's funny. My, my truth is I don't like people with dark hair. So when you come up to me, I'm going to punch you. Again, you get the point. All these different truth claims, your truth, my truth, their truth. And what happens when all these different truth claims come to the table? Conflict arises. Problems are established. Why? Because we're taking truth and we're making it something that we invent, that we create. The Christian worldview is something completely different. The biblical worldview of truth is not something I create or something my society creates, or even my culture creates. Biblical truth is something that God creates. It's beyond me. It transcends my ideas. There's an arbitration of truth that, be, that goes beyond me. So quickly, when we think of biblical truth, the Bible teaches there are four concrete definitions of biblical truth, and I'm going to cover these quickly. The first is that God himself is truth. In Deuteronomy 32, 4, it says God is truth. He is the God of truth. God is the author of truth. God himself is truth. God is the arbitrator. The very essence of a truth maker is found in God. Truth is outside our realm. It's imposed upon us by God. God establishes the rule. He is the one that holds truth. Those keys, not us. So the Bible clearly says God is truth. But secondly, the Bible teaches that Jesus is truth. Jesus is truth. In John 14, 6, we've already mentioned this, but it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is Jesus himself saying that he is the truth. Jesus is truth incarnate. He's the word of God. He's the standard of God's truth in this world. But the Bible doesn't stop with God, the Father, or Jesus, the Son. The Bible goes on to express that the Holy Spirit is truth. And again, Jesus says this in John 16, 12. The Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. So the Spirit is not only truth himself, he is also leading us to truth. He's bringing us to Christ. He's pointing us to God. So we have God the Father that's truth. We have God the Son that's truth. We have God the Holy Spirit that's truth. And the fourth component that the Bible describes as truth is the Word of God. Scripture is truth. In Psalm 119, it says, Your Word is truth. So the Bible reveals the truth of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you have this one trinity, cultural relativism, societal relativism, I relativism, which is man-centered, and then you have the true trinity of truth, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as expressed through his word. Two completely different definitions of truth but very important for us to understand those differences because we're dealing with the reality of the world's definition on a day-to-day -day basis. So now that we've got the definition of truth out of the way, let's describe truth biblically. And for that, you'll need your Bible. Please open up to the second epistle of John. So go towards the end of the New Testament, find Revelation, Go a couple of blocks over to the left, and you have the second epistle of John. And when you're finding that, I'm just going to give you a few little interesting facts about this epistle. First of all, ladies, this should be of interest to you. It's one of the only books in the New Testament that's addressed to a lady. So that, that of itself is interesting. It's probably, most scholars think it was addressed to a lady and her household, or a lady and a church that met in her house. The author is the Apostle John. He probably wrote this in the last 
10 years of the first century, maybe around 80 or 90 A.D. And in this short epistle of 13 verses that we'll go through quickly all tonight, so you could say you covered a whole book of the Bible. <laughs> we find those four components of biblical truth. It's one of the reasons why I chose this epistle. We find that truth is from God the Father. We find that truth is defined by Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and through His Word. So all those four concrete definitions of truth, biblical truth, are found in here. But to help us navigate this short book, we're going to look at seven short components or seven short points found in this to help us describe truth. The first is the foundation of truth, and that's found in verses 1 through 3. It says, The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth, in love. Notice that in these three verses, truth is used four times. Four times. As a matter of fact, the word truth is only used five times in the full epistle, but four of them are found in this, these first three verses. But there's two things I want you to focus in on in these three verses. The first is the foundation of truth. John, in verse 3, clearly states that God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation. They are the ar arbitrators. They are the initiators of truth. And he also throws in love, which we'll get to in a moment. But the foundation of truth is God. God is the ultimate truth. Not us, not society, not our culture, but God is ultimate truth. But then the second thing I want you to look in these three verses is that truth is found in us. True, God is the foundation, but he imparts it. He gives it to us. And look at this in verse 1 and 2. To the elect and her ladies, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Look at all those prepositions. With, in. Truth is in us. And how did it get there? How does truth get in us? We receive it when we receive Jesus Christ. When we repent from our old person and turn to Christ and receive him, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth comes in us and starts leading us what? To truth. But notice the progression that John uses here. He uses the word know. Usually, the progression starts with our head. I know the truth. I know, I know Jesus Christ. I know the Holy Spirit lives in me. I know God the Father loves the world. I know his word is speaking to me. It's something I know. The Greek word for that is gnosko. It's this idea of knowing through experience. I know this. It's happened to me. I'm transformed because of this. But notice it doesn't just stop with your head. It goes from your head to your heart. Why? Because John uses the words in and abides. It's this idea that once it's Gone from your head, it enters in the very fabric of your being. It's part of who you are. It's part of your, your heartbeat. And that word for abide means dwell or take up residence. So truth has started in your head, but then it's went to your heart. It's taken up residence there. It's dwelling there. But then notice the sequence. John then goes to, and he says, with. So in your day-to-day -day activities, in your life, Truth is with you because God is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. So it goes from your head to your heart to your hands. The Holy Spirit is guiding you, is leading you to be like Christ, 
but leading you in your understanding of Scripture, leading you in determining between right and right, convicting you, establishing you in the things of God. So it starts with your head, goes to your heart, but ultimately it comes to your hands that he's with you in the day-to-day things. So the first thing we learn is God's the foundation, but truth is also found in us. The second thing we learn from this letter is what I call the feet of truth. And this is found in verse 4. It says, I rejoiced greatly that I have found some of your children walking in the truth as we received commandment from the Father. Look at that word walk. That word in Greek is peripateo. Peripateo. And peripateo means to tread with, to walk alongside, or to be preoccupied with something. And what is it that John says that these people are preoccupied with? Truth. And what applies to the people back in that day should apply to us today. Ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, we should be preoccupied with the truth of God. We should be preoccupied with the things of God. And you go, well, how do I do that? Well, luckily John answers it for us. Look at the second half of verse 4. As we received, and that word received means to acquire or obtain the commandments from the Father. So where do we get truth from, according to John? From the commandments, from Scripture. So how do we go about being occupied with the truth? How do we tread with and obtain it? We become occupied by God's Word. We let it saturate and soak our life. We're like that tea bag that's just infused in water. We let it soak into us. We let it consume us. That is what John is calling us to do. So the feet, the walking of faith, is to walk in the path of the Bible. The third thing that John teaches us regarding truth is what I call the fruit of truth. The fruit of truth. And here, in verses 5 and 6, we read, And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. You should walk in it. So we're walking in truth. But the fruit of truth, folks, is love. Truth is not just some intellectual concept that we debate and dialogue with. It's not some philosophical treaty that philosophers discuss, though they do discuss that. Truth has feet. And the feet are consumed with love. Love for God. Love for other people. Love and truth are united. Love and truth kiss, so to say. Love must represent truth, and truth must exist in love. I don't know about you, but I've met many people who may have a lot of truth, may have a lot of knowledge, but when they lack love, they're a hard pill to swallow. But I know that person who has truth and love, I'll swallow it. Because love demonstrates the reality of truth in that person's life. If you're just spouting truth, if you're just spouting facts all day long without the reality of love, you're doing yourself a disfavor and you're doing those around you a disfavor because truth exists in love and love exists in truth. Listen to what John MacArthur said. Truth must exist before love can unite, for truth generates love. I like that. Truth generates love. 
So when you have the truth of God living in you, like John just described, he's living in you, and you're walking with truth. The fruit of your life should be love for other people, love for God. That is the fruit of truth. And notice that John says that we should also walk. There's that word again, peripateo, be occupied, not only in truth, but also with love. The fourth component John teaches us is what I call the flag of truth. Really, this is a warning flag. This is a red flag. It's saying, watch out. John has given us the definition, the foundation, where it's found, the fruit. Now he's saying, what to be on guard against? This flag he's putting it on. And the red flag warning is to be on guard against deceivers. And we read this in verse 7. It says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an anti-Christ. So look at that word deceiver. It means an imposter, a misleader. It means someone who is teaching contrary to the things of of Christ. And folks, I don't need to tell you, we live in a world that's rampant with deceivers. Some are religious deceivers. We call them cults. Some are scientific or philosophical deceivers. Other deceivers are people who don't even know what they're talking about, but they want to sound like they know what they're talking about, so they're just talking to you, trying to convince you of their perspective or their opinion. And John is saying, watch out. You need to put a flag there to be on guard against these people. And what is the one indication that we're to look for according to John? What does John say? John says, for the deceivers do not confess Jesus Christ is coming. I don't know how many times you guys have heard from maybe friends or family, coworkers that said, yeah, I like Jesus. He's a great guy. I just don't believe he's God's son. I don't believe he's the Messiah. I mean, he had a cool, you know, couple cool things to say. He was a good teacher. That, my friends, is a form of deception. That is a false teaching. And cults are great at deceiving you. They'll knock on your door, and they've got the nice tie and the white suit and elder so-and-so, and they'll go, you know, I'm with such-and-such such church, and you go, well, I'm a Christian. You are too? Big smile, you know, the, the twinkle in the eye, you know. I'm a Christian as well. How do you know you're a Christian? Well, because I received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and I've repented from my sins, and I've turned, you know, and you give that. Well, I know I'm a Christian because I had the burning bosom. It's so great we're both Christians. And then they start leading you. They start deceiving you. They're an imposter that's trying to convince you of something that is contrary to what the Bible describes. And so John is telling us to watch out for those flags. Watch out for those individuals, those people in our society who are denying Christ's divinity, who are denying the biblical Christ. Be it a religion, be it a philosopher, be it a scientist, whatever it is, watch out for those people. After the flag, John goes on to give us the final test. The final test. We all like exams. Well, maybe we don't like exams. Well, we like to play those games on our Facebook, but we do like exams to a certain extent. Well, here's an exam, a test, that John is telling us, and this is found in verse 8. It says, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. So what's the test? The test is to look at ourselves. Search our own hearts, our own lives. That word look, underline it. It's the Greek word that means, that is blepo. I know it's kind of an odd word, but it means to take heed or to search your life. And that just doesn't mean sin, and, and it can mean that, but it also means your thought processes. Lord, what is it I believe about you? 
Do I have a biblical view concerning you? What's my ideas about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Scripture? Search myself. Look at my heart. Look at my mind and determine what I believe. And then look what it says in verse 8. That we do not lose. And that word is that we do not, it's not perished in our life. That we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. So though we're searching our life and we're asking ourselves, where do I stand in relationship to these important elements? The end result is that when we're walking in truth and put on the feet of love and seeking God, there's a final reward. It's called communion with Christ. It's spending eternity with the Savior. It's what we call heaven. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. But it begins with this test of searching ourselves, of what Paul would say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So the final test. And then John gives us the failure to follow truth. The failure to follow truth. And that's for, found in verses 9 and 11. Listen to this. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deed. So what's the failure to follow the truth? The failure to follow the truth that God has established and outlined is that we don't find God. That we don't have that fellowship with the Father through the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit. The failure, and there could be someone sitting in this room tonight who's failing on this very point. You haven't turned your life over to Christ. You haven't believed what the Bible declares to be true about Christ. And I want you, if that is you, to notice that you do not have God. You may have eye relativism. You may have a cultural understanding. You may even have a societal understanding of truth. But you do not have God unless you have Christ. Unless Jesus Christ lives in your heart, you do not have God. And that, my friends, I think is a scary proposition. Notice that the word doctrine is stated three times in this section. It's another word like truth that's repeated by John over and over. And what does doctrine simply mean? Good teaching. We're lucky here at Calvary. Skip is faithful to teach week after week after week good teaching. Line upon line, verse upon verse. We have great doctrine imparted to us, but there's a whole host of people, as we just saw, who don't want to teach us good doctrine. They have their own ideas. And John says, don't listen to them. Not even don't listen to them. Don't even invite them into your house. Or as I said at the beginning of the sermon, into your head. Keep them at bay. Keep those ideas away. Because once you start to entertain those ideas, and they start to become part of who you are, pretty soon what happens? You're going more and more. Oh, okay, maybe, maybe Jesus isn't the only way to God. Okay, maybe the Bible's not the word of God. You know, maybe this whole Christian thing is just made up. And then all of a sudden, you're on the outside looking at what you used to be. You've become an imposter. You've walked away when you let these ideas creep into your mind and into your homes. So that's why I believe John is clear. Do not receive them into your home or greet them a mental 
element. Four, he who greets them shares in the evil deeds. When you assimilate those things into your home. So ask yourself, stop right now. Ponder for a moment, what is it you let in your home? <coughs> Through television. And again, I'm not here advocating that you don't have a TV in your house. Not saying that at all. But what is it you're watching? What is it you're allowing your kids to watch? Your husband or your wife to watch? And how are those thoughts, that concepts, influencing the way you think? Are you allowing Oprah or Dr. Phil or Ellen be the arbitrator of what's true for you? Or are you letting Scripture be the foundation of what is truth? But failure in these things can lead to a great fall. Failure to abide by the principles outlined in Scripture can lead to a great fall. And then finally, John wraps up this short letter by giving us the fullness. He says, having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that your joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you, amen. The fullness of God comes to us when we're found in the truth of God. The fullness of what God wants to do in your life and in my life and in every Christian's life and in every denomination and every stripe and every believer around the world is he wants to impart his truth and then let us be truth givers. And that's the fullness he wants for us. He wants to just give us good gifts with the hope that you will then go and give that gift away. Be it love. Be it peace, patience, kindness. Be it the good news of Jesus Christ. But to give these things away and the fullness of what God wants in your life will be upon you. Because when you incorporate the truth of Christ into your life, your joy will be satisfied. You will be jam-packed with God's goodness, His grace, His mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, you will become more and more like Christ. And isn't that the whole goal of our life? To be Christ-like in our very demeanor, in our actions, in our words. His character imposed upon us. His truth infused in our life. So we've defined truth. We've looked at briefly what the historical cultures have said regarding truth. We look at what our current culture says about cultural relativism, societal relativism, and I relativism. We looked at the, what the Bible had to say about truth. Truth is God. Truth is Christ. Truth is the Holy Spirit. Truth is found and communicated through his scripture. But then we looked at these seven points outlined by John. The foundation of truth, the feet of truth, the fruit, the flag, the final test, the failure, and the fullness of truth. The only thing left is to ask you, are you standing in the truth? Is the truth in you? Has it taken up residence? Is it dwelling in you? Andre Kosenberger states that the concept of truth is inextricably tied to the person of Jesus Christ. God is truth, and his word is truth. And since Jesus is the word become flesh, the one-of-a-kind son from the Father, the only way for us to know the truth is to know God through Jesus. My question is, are you tied to truth? Do you know God through Jesus Christ? Or are you like that guy in my cultural anthropology class, just hanging your hat on all these different truths? I don't want to hang my hat on the lamppost or on the flagpost. 
I want to hang my hat on the truth, what it really is. And I'm asking you, what hat are you hanging on what pole? Are you walking in the shadows like the guy in my culture anthropology class? Or are you walking in the substance of the person of Jesus Christ? Because that is where truth is found. So don't be a seeker. Be a finder. Come to the one who calls you. Come to the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And remember that truth is not something we invent, but something we discover as God has revealed. So I invite you to discover the truth of Jesus Christ and watch your life be forever changed. So in the quietness of your heart, where you're sitting, I'm not going to call anyone forward. Take a few moments to talk to God, asking His truth to fill you. Asking his spirit to lead you to truth. Take a moment and say, God, what am I putting in my home? What have I put in my head? Maybe I need to realign my thoughts with what you have outlined in Scripture. Let's just take a moment, and then I'll conclude us in prayer. Father, as we sit in this quiet moment, in this quiet place, we pray that your spirit of truth would just fill us to overflowing, comforting us with your love, but also correcting us, Lord, where needed. I pray, Lord, that we would align ourselves not with truth as described by this world, but is truth revealed by you. For Lord, you are truth. We thank you for the truth of Jesus Christ. That truth lives in us by the Holy Spirit and his power. And that you have conveyed truth through your word. Lord, let us now walk in that truth. Let it enter our heads and go to our hearts and come to our hands so that we will be knowing and doing. We would be growing and going. Our life would be consumed and preoccupied with you, Lord, for you are truth. And Father, maybe there's someone here who doesn't know your truth, who doesn't know you. I pray that you would speak to them in a unique way. That your spirit of truth would convict them of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. And they would realize and recognize that they need your truth. That they're tired of following after their own agenda. They're tired of being their own God or letting society be, be their God or even our culture. But they want the one true and living God. So speak to them, Lord, right where they're at. And if that's you, just simply pray in the quietness of your heart. Lord, I need you. I need your truth to fill me. I turn from my sins. I recognize I'm a sinner. And I turn to the one who is truth, Jesus Christ. So fill me, Father, with your truth, the Holy Spirit, and let me walk fresh, anew, a person passionate about you and your truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you've missed any of our Expound studies, all of our services and resources are available at expoundabq.org.